Thank you for joining today. I'm Dr. Brittany Cunningham with the CNA Center for Justice Research and Innovation and serve as the project director for the Using Analytics to Improve Officer Safety and Wellness Project. On behalf of the Bureau of Justice Assistance Valor Initiative, I welcome you to today's webinar focused on organizational stress. I do wanna let you know that the webinar is being recorded for the benefit of others who may view it later. We do encourage you to make your thoughts and questions known today. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. We'll answer as many questions at the end of the webinar as we can or that time allows. The webinar will be interactive and include polling questions at various points throughout. All poll questions will be anonymous, so your answers will not be linked to you. In fact, we're gonna get started with a poll question. So I'm gonna ask Jessica to launch our first one and then I'll go over the um, question, the responses here in a second. Um, so while you're answering that, I wanted to tell you a bit about today's webinar. Today we'll include a brief presentation from Dr. Dan Lawrence on the findings related to organizational stress from a survey we deployed to 11 participating agencies in our project. After Dr. Dan Lawrence's brief presentation, we'll move into a facilitated discussion moderated by Jessica Dockstetter with four esteemed panelists. Our panelists include retired public safety director, Jess Smith, who's a senior advisor with us at CNA, Division Chief Erica Martinez from Indio, California Police Department, Dr. Tia White from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and First Deputy Director Matthew Davis with the Illinois State Police. After the facilitated discussion, we'll have a chance for Q&A before we close out. So thank you all for answering our first poll question. Um, I will, let me look at the results here. So it looks like most of you are supervisors. Um, and when we ask about your current stress level, um, mildly, it looks like mildly stressed um, is, at 20, is at 63%. Um, throughout the next hour, we will talk about that. Um, so the next hour and a half, we'll discuss coping mechanisms and provide insights that are relevant for supervisors, but also non-supervisors. Again, thank you for joining today. I'll turn it over for our opening remarks and I wanna introduce you to Senior Policy Advisor, Deborah Meter. Deborah. Thank you so much, Brittany. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, as Brittany mentioned, my name is Deborah Meter and I am a Senior Policy Advisor at the Bureau, at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which is a part of the Department of Justice. And under BJA, I have the great pleasure and honor of leading our Valor Officer Safety and Wellness Initiative. And the work that is being done um, with CNA in partnership with CNA um, is a part of our Valor Officer Safety and Wellness Initiative. Um, and the goal of what we're trying to do with this program, with this activity, is to um, see what we can do to help increase wellness, what, what issues are there, what are not started there, how can we help address wellness in the field for law and law officers. Um, we are here to serve you, you serve your agencies and your staff. And, and so having you join us today um, really does mean a lot to us. us um, we're really excited about the conversation we're going to have today. Um, I will be sitting in and listening in and taking notes. Um, because, um, again, our, our mission is to make sure you and your staff are going home safe and well, emotionally, physically, uh, mentally well at, at the end of every single shift and that you have a career and that your staff have a career um, where you all have the tools and the resources um, that you need to make your wellness a priority. Organizational stress is something that um, unfortunately comes with the job, right? I'm, I'm a former Montgomery County, Maryland police officer. So I understand um, about organizational wellness, never was a supervisor, never had um, a supervisory role, but I can imagine um, what the amount of stress is that, um, that you all face day to day. Um, so really for us, it's really important that we understand what all of those stressors are um, and that we understand as well what some people define as wellness 
um, and what some people defined as stressors. Um, going out there in the field, talking to officers throughout the country, um, some may not understand that they are actually dealing with stress because they define stress as something completely different. Um, when, you know, and after we have conversations like, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess I am stressed. Um, it, but they, they start to feel as though well, it's just part of the job. This is normal. This isn't stress. Um, so it, again, it, it is such a complex issue and the topic. Um, and so thank you so much for giving us your time today. Um, and I hope that you find uh, what we talk about today useful. And uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for everything that you do. Please stay safe and be well. And with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you, Britton. Thanks, Deborah. Um, well, let's get started. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dan Lawrence. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Lawrence. I'm a research scientist at the CNA Corporation's uh, Center for Justice Research and Innovation. So I'm going to take about 10 minutes here just to talk about some of the stressors and challenges that we've identified in the lives of law enforcement staff. Um, as uh, this work comes from a, a larger project examining law enforcement staff wellness uh, funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance, um, where we partnered with 11 law enforcement agencies across the country to collect varied perspectives on issues related to officer wellness. Before we get into the study, I do first want to talk about some of the consequences um, of poor wellness. And I think we know, as this group uh, probably very likely knows, that um, we know a lot of these, and uh, I'll only mention some of the major ones that law enforcement officers and staff experience when dealing with poor health and wellness. So physiologically speaking, scholars have found that work stress and poor wellness have been related to higher levels of heart disease and high blood pressure, and the weight uh, from vest and belt can negatively affect spines over the long term. Psychologically, the aspect associate, aspects associated with patrol officers' repeated hypervigilance over long stretches of time increases stress and poor wellness, leading to higher levels of anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. Behaviorally, staff dealing with higher levels of stress tend to drink more and have more challenges in their relationships, such as higher divorce levels. And professionally speaking, we see decreases in job satisfaction, higher level uh, turnover, high turnover rates, um, increases in sick days and lost pro productivity. So these are just some of the negative health related um, outcomes that we that, that come across uh, in working with a law enforcement agency. And I certainly haven't mentioned them all. Um, but what we're really interested in was um, looking at some of the stressors that um, are identified by both sworn and non-sworn staff in, in law enforcement agencies. And that brings us to a study, um, CNA's project titled Using Analytics to Improve Officer Safety and Wellness. We're currently in our second phase of this project, which is focusing on officer wellness. The first phase actually examined calls for service data from four agencies to estimate the factors related to high risk incidents and identify drivers of officer injuries. More recently though, we've conducted staff surveys in nine agencies, law enforcement agencies across the country. These agencies were of various sizes that included a state police department, a tribal agency, along with seven city level agencies um, to collect information about uh, staff wellness and wellness programs. The data were collected just earlier this year, so it's very recent. Um, we were able to attain responses from all types of staff members, including uh, any level of civilian position as well as sworn staff. Uh, the total sample that we collected from was approximately 1300 uh, staff members and that included 850 sworn staff and 400 professional staff. Um, but for the following analyses, we pulled information from 993 respondents who provided written information to a single open-ended item. And that item asked respondents to describe what caused their mental and emotional health to deteriorate in life and work. And this item was purposely designed to be very broad because we wanted to have many perspectives as possible. And it's worth noting here that 78% of all the respondents provided an answer to this question, which is a relatively high amount for a survey question that has a, a voluntary written response. So it was pretty clear to us from the start that law enforcement staff certainly want to talk about these issues, issues about the stresses that they have. After reading and hand coding all the responses to that item, we identified 38 unique um, issues or challenges that the respondents identified as deteriorating their mental and emotional health. And I'll de detail each of those momentarily, um, but first wanna highlight the majority of the issues. Um, that the majority of the issues pertain to management, 
of leadership or direct supervisors, with more than half of all respondents identifying at least one issue within that domain. Just, then, just less than half of the respondents identified one or more workplace or life stressors that affecting their mental and emotional well-being, while roughly a third identified mental health-related issues. A fourth identified workplace culture issues, and finally a fifth of the sample identified public support or political support um, as being a challenge to their emotional well-being. And I'm going to go through each of these in a little bit more detail now, but I do want to emphasize that the first two, um, the leadership supervisors and workplace stressors, um, involve issues and challenges that are directly related to the staff's work, um, mainly issues that are manageable by the agency. So respondents identified eight issues that pertain to leadership or supervisor challenges affecting their well-being. The most prominent of those was um, not feeling supported by their, their upper management or their higher staff. And this could come from a high profile event, such as a command staff not really supporting or backing an officer that other staff felt was acting in good faith or within policy and the law during a critical incident. Um, or it could be from a more mundane uh, event, such as not getting support when a staff member is feeling overwhelmed with the work. A lot of staff also identified being poorly managed or overmanaged as a leading stressor. Essentially, they advised that they want to be trusted to do the work required of them. But associated with that, they were also frustrated with how much work, um, how much of the expectations of their work changed or how unrealistic some of the goals were um, reaching some of those goals. And there were many who expressed a lack of, they, they felt that there was a lack of appreciation for the work that they do. The second leading group of stressors in their lives came from, uh, were associated with work that the law enforcement staff do. Um, so this likely isn't surprising to many of you, but they expressed that there's just too much work um, leading to burnout in their, in their jobs, in their lives. Um, much of this came from a lack of staff, a lack of resources, a lack of equipment. Um, and it made all their work uh, much more challenging to do their day-to-day -day operations. There were many different noted life stressors um, with poor work-life ba work -life balance being the leading issue. Um, a notable issue was the ability to decompress and that not just having um, personal time to themselves, but also having time after completing a call or having breaks that were respected by their colleagues and supervisors so that they could mentally prepare themselves for the next call. Financial stress and stress from family duties and other personal um, life aspects were also top issues. Roughly a third of the sample detailed one or more mental health issues uh, deteriorating their well being. Um, most notably, were aspects of not having the time and ability to develop good coping mechanisms. Um, many staff mentioned that seeking therapy was challenging for them, um, and they also felt a uh, stigma from their colleagues or work culture about seeking that help. A notable mental health challenge regarded the amount of traumatic events that the staff witnessed. Um, and this was among both sworn staff as well as civilian staff. Um, there are a few crime scene, crime scene analysts and dispatchers who expressed being really worn down by the amount of trauma that they dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. Issues pertaining to workplace culture covered a host of different um, things. Uh, but we categorized them into these three main groupings. The first corresponded to challenges with colleagues, um, which included things like having a difficult relationship with a colleague, feeling that other colleagues weren't doing their fair share of the work um, required of them, aspects of nepotism or favoritism in promotions, and feeling that too, some staff were too inexperienced for the positions that they held. And the culture category, which was mentioned pretty frequently, was just a broad um, category collecting aspects of police culture. Um, although there was some overlap with that final category, which spoke to about staff being really gossipy, toxic, or just negative in their behaviors um, and mentalities during their work. And finally, about one fifth of the sample mentioned how current public views toward the police affect their mental health, um, as well as feeling that political agents from their city, such as the chief or the DA, actively do not support law enforcement staff in their work. Um, I would also note that very few respondents mentioned specifically how law uh, how community members um, were disrespectful or difficult with police staff during interactions. And this is the final chart. Um, it ranks the top 10 issues from those 38 that were detailed in the responses. And I'll note here that 88% of the respondents noted at least one of these issues in their comments. Um, so what really jumps out at me in this chart is that really only two of them, um, that is public perceptions and an individual's ability to cope, are really outside the agency's direct ability to manage and control. 
What I mean is an agency can be better develop work policies to improve work-life balance for their staff that can also ensure that they don't um, get overworked when on duty. Um, for example, many staff from one of the larger agencies in the study advocated for the 10-hour, four-day-a-week um, work shift as opposed to the typical eight-hour a day uh, across five days. Um, they felt that this shift schedule allowed them to have more time in the field to respond to calls while also allowing them to have time off with their families and handle other um, personal matters in their lives. Such policies and aspects could have secondary benefits of supporting staff, improving morale, while also reducing general work stress. And furthermore, requiring uh, in-depth trainings for supervisors or yearly in-service management trainings could support staff by ensuring that managers know how to set clear expectations and that their staff feel that they have the ability to be trusted and get the task done without feeling that they're being micromanaged. So those manager trainings could be critical to improving uh, the relationships with other staff. Um, such changes could also provide, uh, could potentially improve workplace culture and hopefully um, how colleagues may treat each other. And I know that such, par these are like paradigm shifts, um, they're, they're monumental. Um, so I'm making it seem very simplistic here, but by identifying the specific challenges that your staff face, you can begin by, to identify areas where improvement is needed, whether it's in policy, management, or culture. Which brings me to the first takeaway point here is, is try to reach out and listen to your staff. Um, I know that staff are often bombarded with surveys nowadays, um, many questions, um, research-oriented or, or within um, an agency. But internal surveys from the department that are, um, they're typically better received um, as long as the collected information is made transparent and actions come from those results. Um, law enforcement staff are already jaded enough and there's nothing worse than expressing oneself um, but not being heard and not seeing changes happen. Second, based on these results, it's clear that law enforcement agencies have a, a lot of power to improve officers and staff's work and personal lives. Um, staff primarily want support, better management, and just more time to decompress. Finally, um, there is going to be a forthcoming report from this work um, that we're going to go into more detail to examine how staff may differ from each other in their um, demographic characteristics or position characteristics. So keep an eye out for that. And with that, I'll thank you all for listening. Um, here's my contact information if you'd like to follow up with me. And I'd also like to thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank the agencies that partner on this project. It was a, it was a huge task to collect this data, and we're really appreciative of their work um, with us to collect these perspectives. So thank you so much. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, we really appreciate that presentation. And I think that what you spoke about is really, uh, it's very prescient as you can see in the poll results. And so most of you, 55% um, actually said that your stress is caused by your job from 50 to 75% of your stress. Um, also, most of you noted that supervisory related stress um, causes, you, causes you the most stress, um, followed by the increase in amount of work and low staffing. And so we'll be talking about all of these things today, um, but we just, again, wanna thank you for providing your, um, your input. So I'll stop sharing those poll results and introduce myself. So my name is Jessica Dockstader. I'm an associate research analyst here at CNA. I'm also a doctoral student at the University of San Diego, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Uh, before we jump in, I'd like to allow each of our esteemed panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Director Jeff Smith, Division Chief Erica Martinez, Dr. Tia White, and First Deputy Director Matthew Davis. Um, so we'll start with you, Director Smith. Thanks, Jessica. As she said, my name is Jeff Smith. I'm a senior advisor with CNA. Uh, previously, I'm a retired director of public safety from a smaller agency, so a police fire chief, um, 26 years of law enforcement experience, um, and I've been helping out with the officer safety wellness project um, for a while now. So thank you for having me. Hi, good morning all. This is Erica Martinez. I'm division chief of support services with uh, Indio Police Department. And I've been with our agency for 15 years, and it's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon uh, from Springfield, Illinois. Uh, my name is Matt Davis with the State Police. My uh, 25th year of service uh, with the State Police. Um, we're an agency that serves uh, over 12 million citizens in the state of Illinois. We have about 1,800 sworn officers, about 950 civilian employees. And I just want to thank uh, everyone for the opportunity to participate. <laughs> in this important discussion. Um, I'm Dr. Tia White. I um, am also a licensed clinician, 
and I work with the Vegas Metro Police Department building their wellness bureau and uh, specialize with first responders of mental health. So this, uh, the research I did was all about this kind of stuff. So this is true to my heart and I'm grateful to be here. Well, thank you all for joining. And as you all can see, we have a wealth and diversity of experience today on the panel. And I'm really looking forward to, for them to be able to share their experiences. Um, but first, I would like to thank Dr. Lawrence for sharing with us about the primary work and life stressors um, experienced by agency members. So many of the themes he discussed, such as leadership and supervisors, workplace stressors, and workplace culture were prominent in the interviews that we conducted. Um, follow, we conducted interviews after the survey was deployed to the agencies that participated in the study. Um, it's also really important to note that workplace stress isn't unique to law enforcement. So recently, the U.S. Surgeon General and the American Psychological Association released reports about workplace mental health and well-being. Um, and many of their themes are in line with what the supervisors that we interviewed spoke about. So while workplace culture and stress is something of importance at the national level across all industries, uh, today we're gonna dive deeper into the types of organizational stressors experienced specifically by law enforcement, um, coping mechanisms that they can use and how a command staff member can help to reduce stress for their supervisees. So for the first part of this discussion, we're going to hear about the contributors to organizational stress. Um, those that we interviewed really shared a lot of different types of um, ways that they experienced organizational stress, um, very much in line with what Dr. Lawrence shared. Um, in the interviews that we conducted with the agency members, both sworn and professional staff shared that their, um, the contributors to organizational stress that they experienced fell under five main categories, uh, supervisory related stress, an increase in amount of work, low staffing, interpersonal challenges, and burnout. So all the answers that are all the ways that you all, um, when you answered that poll question, it's very much in line with what the agency members across the country were experiencing. Specific to supervisory related stress, um, some of the command staff shared concerns about the impact of organizational level decisions on their relationships with those they supervise, such as the need for mandatory overtime, salary related decisions and scheduling, um, other command staff shared that they felt additional pressure due to the amount and type of job responsibilities that they assumed when they became a supervisor, um, the continued understaffing and de uh, deployment concerns, frequency of policy changes, um, and also the need to meet budgetary requirements. Command staff also noted that they, um, in experiencing an increase in amount of work, they said that the workload that they were encountering is on an unprecedented level. Um, this increase in workload impacted their ability to maintain a work-life balance, um, which I'm sure many of you in law enforcement can understand. Uh, low staffing also influenced the ability for a supervisor or command staff to, to experience a work-life balance, and they felt that more hires would help to reduce the stress that they and their team um, experienced. Uh, but the ability to recruit and retain members is influenced, they felt, by public perception of law enforcement. Uh, finally, command staff did note that the different types of leadership styles that they observe and that they um, that they participate in can impact supervisory and employee well-being, specifically micromanaging versus encouraging self-sufficiency. Um, and the in intricacies of managing and working with multiple generations was also a very common theme um, that we experienced. So I would like to open it up to our panel now um, and start with UDC Martinez. So you previously shared with us how you and your agency and your command staff are coping with low staffing. So can you talk with us about how that has affected you and your command staff? And also the other panelists are encouraged to chime in as well throughout the discussion today. Absolutely. Um, so just um, give you a little profile of our India Police Department. So I oversee our 911 center, right? Um, so like the majority of law enforcement agencies here in the region, we're also dealing with a staffing shortage. And just a little profile on the city of India. So we're the largest city um, in the Coachella Valley region. So we're about 100 miles east of Los Angeles. It's called the uh, Southern California Desert Region, Coachella Valley region. So you have major um, tourist spots like Palm Springs, city of Palm Springs. We are also the host City and the host agency uh, for major international concerts. I'm sure you've heard of Coachella concert, Stagecoach concert. So our population here is about 100,000 um, uh, for the city. However, when we have our concerts, our population doubles, right? Going back to 
increased calls for service, you know, for our dispatch center. So we go from uh, 90,000 to 120,000 for the whole month of April as the host agency for those concerts, uh, which is it's great, you know, for the economy, for the city. Um, so that's the local, locally, that's um, what our center is dealing with and also being the largest um, and most populated city in the Coachella Valley. We also handle a large number of calls for service. So just to give you an idea in terms of our numbers, we're handling approximately 161,000 calls for service that come into our center on an annual basis. That's about 43,000, 44,000 911 calls. And then, of course, we have non-emergency calls, about 117. And um, going back to low staffing, Currently, we're authorized for 14 full-time dispatch positions. However, right now we're down to seven uh, with one on extended leave. So what we're called critical, right, critical staffing shortage, uh, very similar to the other agencies nearby. Um, so that, of course, you know, that's a stressor, you know, for our, um, for our staff and going back to mandated overtime, right? So during the concerts, nobody takes a day off. You know, maybe we would take about a day off, um, but if there's a call out or somebody's out sick, then we have to call back um, a dispatcher to come and provide support. Um, we're dealing with attrition, right? So we have um, what happens when you hire someone, you know, 20 years ago, you hire a group of dispatchers and come 20, 25 years later, they're all gonna retire at the same time. So um, we're dealing with attrition-related um, staffing shortages. Um, also with um, our police trainee program, we've had some um, trainees who have resigned during the trainee program, citing uh, the high uh, stress nature of the job and just um, you know the the primary reason as to why they decide to move away from um, 911 dispatching. Um, in addition to that, another contributing factor to a low staffing is it takes us approximately three to four months, you know, I'm sure very similar to other agencies on this panel, um, to fill a position, right? And we're competing, we're competing with other, with five or six other agencies in our valley. Um, we're competing for the same pool of applicants, right? Um, again, very um, competition, we're trying, we're doing recruitment, we're We've been do, doing really well with our recruitment efforts. We have an outstanding, in my opinion, uh, recruitment team. Um, so we do have some dispatchers, right? The light at the end of the tunnel, we have some dispatchers in background. Um, our agency has also recently started to hire new dispatchers at a higher step, right? So trying to offer more competitive uh, wages. Um, and um, nationally, I guess, um, talking about low staffing, right, this is, um, there was a survey in June of 2023 from the National Emergency Association, NINA, which also cites, you know, that 82% of um, 911 centers from the, across the country are experiencing low staffing, burnout, um, increased uh, calls for service. So again, you go back to the widespread nature of uh, what many, law enforcement professionals are calling the staffing crisis. You know, we see that here in California and it seems that it's, um, it's across the country right where we're dealing with uh, the same um, staffing concern. So something that California is doing is um, in order to try to help us with uh, police dispatch retention, we, the legislation I think is trying to classify dispatchers from a clerical position to a first responder, very similar to fire, very similar to police officer. And with that, it comes um, more um, benefits in terms of uh, leave and some of the benefits that are offered to protected um, um, first responders that they're trying to provide and offer those benefits to our police dispatchers as well. So yeah, so in a nutshell, I think um, that's um, what captures what our agency is dealing with, and I'm sure it mirrors what other panelists and other some of our attendees are also dealing with. So, thank you so much, DC Martinez, and it's really great to hear you talk about also the, you know, the solutions that are 
you know, being put forth to address some of these systemic issues, right? Like that legislation in California, I think that's a really great idea. Um, and I'm definitely gonna look more into that. Um, Director Davis, you had also mentioned how your agency recently underwent an organizational restructure. Um, did you wanna also talk about how that impacted your staff with the relation to organizational stress? Sure, absolutely. Um, the, our agency went through recently, uh, effective January 1, kind of a historic restructuring of our statewide patrol districts, as well as our uh, 911 radio dispatch uh, districts as well. So it was a, a very significant project that uh, required a lot of work on the front end and really some deliberate change management um, throughout the project. It was, it was really uh, valuable for us to get the results of the survey uh, that, you know, our agency was the, the state police agency that, uh, you know, contributed to the data and get an understanding and a lens through which, you know, to see how effective we are in, in organizational stress, you know, around the area of, of change management, because a lot of the issues from supervision to resources to work kind of, you know, permeated this, this large project that we, that we just completed. So, um, you know, I think it was really important when we we looked at the restructuring. Uh, we executed it successfully. Um, there were some bumps and bruises along the way, and I think we debrief, we learn, and we adapt uh, to get a little bit better. Um, and and the way we tried to frame this, and I think a lot of the the survey research, you know, uh, corroborated this approach, is to to frame the overall change for the organization in the context. Of, of kind of previously agreed upon strategic goals. Everyone knew we were short staffed. Everyone knew demands were increasing on us. And then it felt like we were throwing an extra stressor on the table when actually this restructuring was, you know, a countermeasure uh, to try to alleviate that. So we tried to message that in a way to show that these this, this change that we were introducing um, was, was to address a lot of previously uh, agreed upon problems, issues, and goals. And we tried to message it in a way that, you know, people throughout our organization didn't feel like they were just thrown in the trunk of a car and driven around and, you know, didn't know where they were going or, or what we were doing. Um, so to do that, um, you know, to address the messaging component, um, we tried to develop very deliberate messaging and timelines and to coincide a lot of the change management with other historic uh, periods of change in the agency uh, or, or annual periods of change. So, you know, January 1 of every year, work schedules and, and shift assignments, you know, uh, regularly change. So ensuring that we harmonize this overall change with a regular change cycle that people were used to so they could adjust their, their personal lives and their, and their planning around that was, was very important to try to deal with some of those interpersonal challenges that people were dealing with. Um, we were very deliberate on our internal and external messaging. Um, we thought we made a message clear internally or externally. We'd seek a little feedback and we find out, well, all we did was, you know, uh, prompt about 20 other questions. So we went through several iterations of that to really try to, you know, alleviate confusion um, and not create interpersonal challenges with our messaging. Um, and in terms of, you know, really trying to do a service for our supervisors who we tasked, you know, to really drive this because they're overworked and, you know, a lot of the information derived from the survey rang true to realize it's difficult to hire, it's difficult to give them the support. So to be creative and come up with uh, consulting services, um, you know, short-term help and consultants to help them, you know, uh, make decisions in some of uh, areas that maybe aren't their, their normal comfort zone with respect to strategic allocation of resources and some of the logistics. So that was another tool we tried to bring uh, to the table to reduce organizational stress. And really um, what we tried to do uh, with a limited degree of success and you know, obviously subject to continuous improvement is just to acknowledge that stress itself is a discrete resource to be acknowledged and managed in an overall change management project um, that you know, we deliberately understand that what we're going to do is going to create stress. It's going to create, you know, additional work. It's going to, you know, change people's personal lives. And as we develop our operational plans and responses, we plan for stress in the same way you'd plan for financial resources or equipment uh, or things like that. Um, and finally, uh, and I think this issue is common, you know, across law enforcement agencies, 
we learned that, you know, there's a good and bad of, of the operational side of law enforcement um, that we can't approach every project and mission with just that get it done attitude of a critical incident. You know, we wanted to give our, our supervisors some flexibility. You know, we're still demanding deliberate goal-oriented work, but flexibility and in, in, uh, managers' uh, ability to manage work and priorities still meet deadlines. So, uh, again, a lot of this was a work in progress. Uh, we just went through a historic uh, reorganization. Um, and, you know, we really want to debrief on how stress was managed throughout the entire incident and get better at getting in front of it, as opposed to just kind of a check the box debrief at the end of the incident. Um, so that was, you know, some of our uh, recent lessons learned from our organizational restructure. And, and again, the, the lens of, of this research and the topics being discussed here really helped us uh, kind of focus on some of our strengths and some of our shortcomings. Thank you so much, Director Davis. Um, specifically, you know, while you were talking, you mentioned a lot about messaging and making sure that you uh, you framed things around um, ideas that folks in your agency had previously agreed upon. And something has come up in the research about a psychological contract um, that employees have, you know, when they join agencies. And I think, you know, it sounds like you all did a really great job with that, um, with helping to mitigate stress, which is normal um, during change. And you also mentioned change management. Um, and, and I, I think that you all uh, did a great job with that. So thank you for sharing um, about that. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna transition to the next topic of our discussion, and we're gonna talk about coping. So in our interviews, agency members also they frequently shared ways in which they coped with the organizational stressors. You know, they told us about what they were experiencing. But as you can tell, um, even with our panelists today, when you talk about a problem, many folks in law enforcement also want to talk about a solution. And so many of them talked about ways in which they coped. Um, members were really creative in, in sharing the ways they coped, from creating a family culture in the agency, supporting one another, exercising, using humor to ease tension in situations, uh, partaking in activities outside of work, uh, being candid with management about their capacity, um, and also practicing a locus of control mindset or only trying to control what they viewed as within their control. So command staff also noted that they had navigated with their own supervisors um, what boundaries look like between um, either practicing insubordination or really placing firm boundaries with, with their own command staff. So um, I'd like to reopen it up to our panel and kind of start with you, uh, Director Smith. What were some of the coping mechanisms that you observed um, in your agency and also that you've used when coping with organizational stress? Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, you know, and that's one, this is one of those ones that's always kind of tough to describe because when you talk about moving up, so if you're talking about line level, um, but as you move up in the chain of command, it tends to also feel a little more isolating too. Um, just because the sheer numbers that you're starting to have around you and what you would consider your peer group um, and not a subordinate tends to go down. But the techniques and a lot of the things that most um, of the people that I'm aware of, that I've used, that we've heard from, they, they tend to do the same thing, and that is making sure and taking steps to really try to make sure that they're communicating and they're talking to each other. So reaching out, supporting, and it can start with things that are just, I don't want to say minor, but might be like run of the mill type things that might cause some stress, but it's nothing huge. So we're not talking about necessarily a critical incident, but before those types of things happen. And basically having that group or those people that you can go to, to discuss what's going on. And as you're doing that, and as you move up into different positions, that peer group may change a little bit. So, you know, you may be down to only a few people that you think that you can maybe open up to, um, or that you can go to, but either through professional organizations, maybe it's regional um, or your local area with other people that are in similar positions. Um, and I know we're going to talk about a little bit um, talking up. So maybe you're talking to someone above you um, and having those candid conversations. But it's basically building those relationships so that when things are coming up stressful um, and being able to try to cope, that you can basically go to each other and talk about it and making sure that you're reaching out. So maybe you're not the one that's going through the stressful situation at the time, but you, you either hear about it 
Um, it's an adjoining shift, uh, adjacent shift um, to you and, you know, another supervisor is going through something that, you know, you maybe, maybe you've already left. Maybe it's just shooting them a text, just reaching out saying, hey, I'm here. Um, you'd be amazed at how many will just come back and, oh, if you've got a second um, or can you take some time? And like I said, that's for the minor things and the major things. And then keeping those relationships as your career transitions and into those different positions. But like I said, I think that a lot of the administrators and things like that that I've talked to that have had different ranks throughout the whatever organization, big, small, it does become a little more isolating, but you just need to get creative with that group um, of who you can reach out to and you're comfortable with. And that's really important. And that's why it seems to be a little bit easier if you start with what I'll call the minor stressors, the everyday pain in the necks um, and that type of thing. Um, because then when something a little bit bigger happens, it, there's a much more um, higher level of comfortability, basically for everybody. Thanks so much, Dr. Smith. I, I really appreciate that. You know, creating creating that family culture or just creating, you know, opening and, and starting it, starting with the little things uh, really opens the door. Um, DC Martinez, you also noted that members of your command staff are are encouraged to have candid conversations with management. Um, can you expand on this and, and share how you created that culture and how it's helped your agency's level of organizational stress? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So for us, you know, similar to what Jeff said, um, just creating that space. And um, it comes from, in my opinion, from at least from our senior executive group, from setting the example, setting that tone right, and um, from our senior executive team, you know, we want to make sure that um, our direct reports and you know part of our management team, their our command staff, they have that. Um, you create a safe space, right, where we come together. You know whether it's a debrief after a critical incident or just you know like Jeff said, minor things. You know, but that could potentially turn into something more significant. Just having the um, the confidence, uh, the safe space. You know where we could have candid respectful, professional conversations, right, and, and to be listened to, right? And um, going back to what Jeff said, um, you know, for us in management, at least my experience, um, it sounds like he was describing our senior management team. I've been very fortunate, you know, to, to have, I think, one of the best um, teams of um, just, you know, my boss, my, my peers, um, to have that support mechanism right here at work, because um, it does, it is a little bit lonely at the top at times and a little bit isolated, but you still have that rapport, those relationships, you know, that as a manager um, help you. Um, for me personally, and I think I've shared this with you, uh, with, uh, with the research team is, um, I believe that it's important, at least for me personally, to have a holistic uh, support system, you know, both spiritually, um, family, um, outside of work, right? Having um, the coping strategies, you know, when you go home, having that handful of people that you trust that you could go and, um, you know, vent or um, just, you know, hear their perspectives, right? Um, but again, more holistically, um, for me, you know, here in the Valley, it's kind of hard to do anything during the summer, you know, but you could do indoor gardening, you know, I have a uh, air gardening um, pot at, at home. Um, we have beautiful trails, you know, um, just exercising, um, practicing uh, mindfulness, right? Um, being able to know yourself, you know, knowing when um, you're feeling stressed, whether you recognize it or not, and just being able to accept those emotions, right, and um, deal with them in a healthy way um, that is going to help you with uh, overall support. And also, um, as a supervisor, I think it's also important to to know your team, right? To know, to sense, at least to when when they're having a bad day, right? Um, talking about boundaries, right? Respecting their boundaries. You know, if they're on vacation, you know, do you really need to call that person? Is it an emergency, right? Just trying to have that respect for your team so they can enjoy that time to disconnect from work as much as we can. We are in law enforcement, you know. Um, it's not always possible, but as much as we can, um, respect your own, your personal boundaries, and also respect um, those of, um, you know, the, the team who works for you. 
Thank you so much, DC Martinez. Uh, I really appreciate that. And especially hearing you talk about how to place those boundaries um, and how to respect your team's time off. Um, I, I think it's very important in, in all different fields. And, um, and I think that we're, we're certainly learning more about that in law enforcement. So Director Davis, you, you had also mentioned that members of your command staff often practice a locus of control mindset um, or, or only try to control things that are, they view as within their control. Could you share with us how you've observed that playing out and how you view that as helping your agency's level of stress? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that we've really tried to deliberately, you know, implement at our at our command staff that I think, you know, helps mitigate stress and increase, you know, uh, overall job satisfaction is to really focus and emphasize that that locus of control or what what we also call internally just subsidiarity, pushing decision making down to the lowest level of competent authority and very clearly outlining goals, strategic goals and expectations, and letting our leaders execute at, at their level. Um, putting their, our, 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 our managers and supervisors in charge of the personnel and resource them, resources, let them make decisions, manage, be accountable for the outcomes, and, and not to micromanage them. Um, you know, to uh, force our kind of upper middle managers and most senior management to stay at the kind of strategic level and let our supervisors have the freedom to operate at the tactical level uh, to carry out missions. We found that when we execute that way, um, there is a, a much stronger sense of ownership. Um, uh, morale seems to be, you know, uh, maintained, you know, uh, fairly strongly from those practices. So we want to, you know, as part of that locus of control, we want to give um, flexibility uh, so that they can determine um, how and where work is done to give our supervisors the latitude, whether it's experimenting with remote work opportunities or process changes. I think we all know one of the beauties of COVID was it really forced us outside of our comfort zone. And, you know, we had seen some great efficiencies across our agency, particularly in, in our forensic laboratories, where our lab directors got very creative and developed some very efficient, you know, blended work models. Um, because they were told, here is your work, you're in control, here are the deliverables, go execute. Um, so we really, as part of that locus control, want to want to empower them to help set priorities. Um, but also, in addition to empowering them, we also want to train them and give them the tools that they need, not only just to manage efficiently, but back to kind of managing and acknowledging stress as a resource that's to be managed that I mentioned earlier, um, this past year, we tried to implement some specific kind of tactical training for our managers as to, you know, when you're given locus of control over your people and your operations, how you can include, you know, the recognition and managing of stress as a, as a real thing. Um, we drew on the, the research of, of, of Dr. Matt Grawich, um, and we tried to get our supervisors and our managers to think of primary, secondary, and, and tertiary points of intervention when we plan as to when we can acknowledge and mitigate stress. So allowing them to eliminate stressors before they need, even need to be managed when they develop you know, where and how work is going to be done, um, kind of the primary intervention, the secondary intervention of mitigating the effects of stress, what can we do? Um, some of the things that uh, Erica just talked about to, to ensure that you know, uh, as missions are being executed, you know, we're, we're mitigating those effects. And then responding to the adverse effects of stress afterwards, you know, the tertiary interventions. So we tried to, you know, not only just encourage uh, locus of control and, and empowerment, but also, you know, acknowledge um, what stressors, uh, the, the negative impact they can have on work and give our supervisors real tools so that they can help develop psychologically healthy workplaces. And again, letting work units experiment and develop these practices helps really develop a genuine culture um, that, are, that, that in many cases rises up out of those work units and that we can celebrate and reward uh, across the agency. And again, this is a, a work in progress. We're, we're very, you know, not, uh, have not reached perfection and probably won't. But um, those are some of the things we're trying to do to increase, you know, locus of control, empowering local managers and giving them the tools they need to create these healthy workplaces. Thank you so much, Director Davis. Um, I wanted to share the poll results that you all answered. Um, and it's it's clear that supporting and receiving support from your fellow employees is, is really very important. 
Um, also being candid with management is, uh, I mean, it seems like all of these really are, were utilized by, by a good amount of you. Um, and so I'm glad that we were able to talk about a little bit um, more of the other coping mechanisms, but, um, but clearly you all are, are using some of these coping mechanisms already. So we're going to head into the last portion of our discussion today, um, how to reduce stress, how to reduce the organizational stress for the supervisees. Um, so we've talked about how command staff have experienced stress and how they've coped, but, um, you know, things flow downhill. And so if command staff are experiencing this type of stress, it's likely that the supervisees probably are also experiencing stress. And so um, those interviewed as part of the project, they shared a variety of, of ways in which they do seek to, to alleviate the stress from their supervisees. Um, some of the ways that they spoke about were leading by example with the adoption of um, wellness behaviors, you know, uh, do what I do, not just do what I say. Um, checking in with their supervisees on the type and amount of workload that they have. Uh, proactively addressing commonly experienced stressors during the onboarding process, um, such as dis discussing stress points such as finances and relationship at, um, at the onset, you know, when folks are joining the profession, um, and also following up with solutions after listening to their supervisees' concerns. It's important to listen, but it's also important to actively listen and, and follow up if there are things to follow up on. Um, many of the supervisors also reference creating spaces for their supervisees to vent and creating space for folks to ask follow-up questions if, if they don't understand something. Um, importantly, everyone has a boss and those who experienced an attentive and compassionate style of supervision, those were the ones in the interviews who described creating this compassionate culture for their supervisees. And so again, you know, what folks experience, they're more likely to provide. So I'd like to reopen it back up to the panel uh, for one last time. And let's start with you, Dr. White. Uh, could you talk about how your agency proactively addresses those stressors um, for those who are starting? Yeah, I think I think one thing to remember is we get caught up in the culture pieces of it, right? Supervisees and supervisors and, and management and, and frontline, but ultimately we're all people and we all respond the same. So the question is, is how it whatever, you know, whatever recommendations we might have for a supervisor it's gonna look kind of the same for our frontline people, right? Like proactive approaches like check-ins, right? Well, somebody, somebody's supervisor all the time. So what are we doing in, in those connection points? We as humans need connection and that connection can make all of the difference in the worst jobs in the world. I don't know if you guys have ever had like the best boss, but most of us would follow our best boss wherever they went because it was so valuable, that connection that we had with them. Um, and we would make life changes to stay with the boss because they're so valuable to us, right? So, but remembering it's the connection that mattered. So we're trying to find ways that we can connect and, and remember that we're humans and people and not just law enforcement, not just the boss, not just the whatever. And sometimes it's simple things like giving a compliment, not just, hey, you did a good job, but hey, I really value how you talk to that community member. Your tone of voice is really calm and mellow. You have a way about you, right? I really admire that you know, but really specific things that are so simple to do make a big difference because it allows them to feel seen. Like you took the time to recognize something little that I did. We have a lot of challenges like everybody at our agency, um, really, you know, short staffed, our 911 times are astronomical right now. I mean, you know, we've got all the things going on, um, but the, the divisions within our, we have, we're 6,000 big, so we're very large. And the divisions and the area commands that are the most successful and the happiest um, it's because leadership took the time to make connection. So is it is it the check-ins like you've been talking about? Is it just the, let's just sit and talk for a minute and, and I know your wife's or your husband's name and your kids' names, right? Taking the time. And when you look at how many, like for example, our sergeants, you know, most sergeants having a 10 to 12 people that they oversee, that's not such an awful number that they can't get to know their people and take the time, right? Um, is it allowing them wiggle room, like to, to your point earlier, it's not about um, not micromanaging, allowing them to feel empowered, 
right? Empowered in doing their job and feeling like they have value and then recognizing that value. And, and I know I'm speaking in really big, broad terms because every agency can do this different, but to, to you know, the point earlier, we are only as limited as our creativity allows us to be. And one thing I've found, two very interesting things is public safety, especially like law enforcement, they um, are very creative individuals. You have to be, and, then, and most people are like, no, I just know policy and I just know structure. No, what call do you go on that is always the same? Not a single one. You could be on car accidents, but every car accident's a little different, right? Like every, every call requires some creativity. And when we start recognizing those strengths that we have, it allows us to be a little bit more open to what we, what we could do and, and what problems and solutions we have. And so we're trying really hard to we call it being strength-based, right? Like who in our department has these strengths that can help teach the rest of us? So I have the guys and the gals that are very uh, creative, like artistically, right? And you're like, oh, what does that have to do with any? Well, you'd be surprised because they start talking about their artistic abilities and all of a sudden they're building connections with others, right? Um, we have those that are really good at um, just making friends. I know that sounds goofy, but how many of your young guys and gals, right, just feel alone? So what are we doing? Well, we're trying to build a mentorship with our people, um, with our peer support team and with our retirees, right? To help these individuals not feel so alone in what they've got. So, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but the point really comes down to all of these ways that we are trying desperately um, to get ahead of it which is the connection point. It's always that connection point. What can we do? Is it a newsletter? Is it a video? Is it a podcast? Is it, you know, whatever it is, how can we do it? And how do we empower our management to be able to do that with their people? And even small ways. Thank you so much, Dr. White. The very important and really good points. Um, did any of the other panelists have, have things that they wanted to chime in on with ways to reduce stress for supervisees before we head into the Q&A portion of today's discussion. Okay, perfect. So we've already started to receive some questions. Um, and for all of those still attending, please do feel free to place questions. You can either send questions to, um, to the host and the panelists, or you can place them in the Q&A, whichever way you prefer. Um, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, the first question that we received is, how have you incorporated remote work uh, for law enforcement? Uh, Director Davis, I think I heard you um, speak about this a little bit. Did you want to take that first one? Sure. Um, you know, our agency being kind of a fully functioning, uh, you know, state police public safety entity for the state of Illinois, you know, we handle our forensic laboratories. We handle, you know, our statewide criminal history repository. Uh, you know, from patrol functions, investigative functions, et cetera, et cetera. Our, our operational wing um, in terms of patrol and investigations and telecommunications, obviously, you know, the remote work options there are, are rather limited. Um, what we have had, what we have tried to do in those areas, and I believe this was mentioned earlier, is explore other work schedules, you know, 410 shifts, other creative shifts that, you know, although it doesn't provide you know, um, remote work flexibility, it does provide for a little more time with the family. Um, so that's, you know, some of the approaches were taken with the those operational roles where remote work, you know, has been difficult. In some of our other areas where remote work has proved very successful, what I mentioned earlier, in our forensic laboratories, um, what we found is our operations that um, are all digital, you know, not requiring the movement of files or you know other you know complications like that, we we have implemented some pretty efficient remote work workflows where you know for example in our forensic laboratories the scientists are two days in the lab doing bench work and then two days of remote work where they can do technical review you know sitting in front of a computer that's proven a very effective model in some of our other administrative support functions where records are 100% electric and we have very you know, strong controls and workflows. Um, we've also seen some success in remote work. So our agency, um, you know, it's, it's managed kind of in a, at a division operational level. Um, 
There's some units that do like a three, two or a two, three um, on our admin support side. But, uh, but again, our telecommunicators and our, our frontline operational folks um, are still, you know, completely uh, not remote, but we're trying to mitigate some of those other uh, stressors or provide a little more flexibility with the, with the work schedules that I mentioned. Thank you. Um, any of the other panelists have things to add on that question? I think one thing that um, in, in other agencies that I've worked with that they've done very, just to piggyback off of what Davis was talking about is, is they've set it up to be successful. Okay. So if we're going to have weekly meetings, then we're going to make sure that it's, that everybody's in whether it's hybrid, right, or or it is online so that whoever's out can do that. Now, I work with some states that are pretty rural, and so they have to, like, you start in your driveway. They're, like, the main hub is, you know, 100 miles away, and they're, they're the ones that I've learned a lot from. So they know the expectation is that I'm going to connect with my teammates on this day and this day and this day, and now we're going to do it virtual. It's not ideal, but then we know that every three months we're going to meet in person, right, or something like that, but, but it really has. I've seen a huge difference between the agencies that don't set it up to be successful, recognizing the variety, recognizing the need versus the ones that just kind of throw it together. Next thing you know, you got a call that you didn't know you had to be on. And it's just such a disconnect. I think it was alluded to earlier in, in prepping people for what to expect. People need to know what to expect, right? So set it up to be successful. It does work. I mean, it, it doesn't take away a lot if it's done well. Right. Going back to what Director um, Davis said, for us, very similar, although we haven't been able um, to, to offer any, again, because of the nature of that work that we do, any remote work for our team, um, we do have more flexible um, scheduling. So for our professional staff, for records, again, very similar. They're able to have the option of working a 410 schedule, right? They're off weekends every Friday off or a Monday off. They also have the option to work a 980 schedule. But some of them actually prefer the shorter days, Monday through Friday. Um, for our police dispatchers, again, very little flexibility um, in, in our 911 centers. However, they do work at 312, which is longer hours, you know, but sometimes they have three days off four, uh, or four days off um, the second week. They're similar to our, our supervisors um, in our 911 center. Again, although we're unable to offer them um, uh, remote work, right? Um, they do have a flexible work schedule. They work for tents and they're, it's more of a hybrid uh, based on any, I take into account their childcare needs, commuting, right? Just trying to give them a little bit of flexibility to the extent that um, the, the agency is able to offer that. Not always, but at least a little bit of flexibility. Thank you so much, DC Martinez. Um, another question we received is, um, how can my agency increase supervisor buy-in to the importance of wellness resources? Um, I think this is a great question. Um, supervisors play a really important role as we've heard about in this discussion. Um, any of our panelists, please feel free to chime in on this question. I can jump in first on this one, maybe. Listening to multiple agencies, you know, so whether it's a supervisor or anybody else, one of the things that we heard over and over again was kind of like everything else in life, word of mouth, right? So if people are using the services and have a good experience, so I should put that caveat on there, and have a good experience with it, they're much more likely to either advertise that or communicate it. Um, so that then reinforces those services and the importance of them. Now, I, th I, I my personal opinion, I think you know, depending, some people are going to have good um, good feedback and some are still probably going to either be skeptical or be worried about the stigma and that sort of thing. However, with supervisors, it's one of those that it's very important that management, administration um, really get the message out. So there is that understanding, you know, and we always talk about top down and we talk about bottom up, you know, but it's one of those really trying to make them I shouldn't say make, but have them understand how important all of the resources are, their availability, what they can do. Um, and then as things occur, 
hopefully you can get, um, and I, I was going to use the term, but I remember from our round table, um, we, we, we didn't want to use the word buy-in anymore. So I, I can't remember what uh, word I changed that to right now. And I'm drawing a blank, but, you know, get that so that everybody kind of understands that as far as your supervisor level. And that way, as these things come out, like maybe it's a yearly reminder or every six months, or it's a quarterly little newsletter that has the blurb, your supervisors are now talking about it with the employees and, you know, explaining some of that importance, but it's back to that messaging and everything else. You know, Matt was talking about, and I don't want to go into a side subject here, but, you know, we always talk about how important communication is. And we all know with law enforcement, uh, you know, and fire and everything else, it's all about trial and error. You know, everybody's trying to do the best, but we learn from our mistakes, hopefully. And we, we try to shift that. But, you know, one of the important things that he talked about was back to that communication piece. You can have the best intentions and you can think you're communicating extremely well. But if you're not taking that feedback back in, re-examining it, and then maybe 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 making those changes, maybe it looked great to 14 of you or something, but three quarters of the rest of the department is like, this either makes me mad, doesn't make sense, um, something like that. So that communication piece should go towards wellness resources also. What are you hearing back? Where are some of those issues? How can you improve it? If you're an administrator, maybe it's going, you have to go to HR and say, hey, have we looked at different resources for just public safety as an example? So that, you know, because some of the, some of the employees are worried that, you know, this, this psychologist or this counselor doesn't really understand the job. And that's an issue. You know, so it's back to that communication piece and then getting that feedback and then running with it. And that also goes a long way with those supervisors, employees, whoever it may be with understanding, you know, we may have missed it a little bit, but we were trying really hard and now we're taking those and we're making those changes so that it will help you out. And then that will help with that messaging and that, that you know, having the supervisors understand the importance along with other people. Can I just piggyback real quick off of, of, of you? I one thing I've seen over and over and over again, years and years, is that consistency matters, right? To your point, we have the staff uh, got elected, everything started, and there was not consistency in the messages. And so started people started feeling hopeless about the wellness programs and different things that were going. And, and hopeless seems like a strong word, but it really was because they're like, wait a second, I thought we were going to be able to, to access resources. And, and so just going around and listening to the hundreds of people feedback it's like well, we just want to understand what's going on just tell us what's going on but it all comes back to the same thing as that consistency um what efforts are being done like it's it's easy to take bad news if you know like if you've been told like over and over again or not even maybe bad news isn't the right term but you know it's easy to say hey i don't know what's going on um but at least hear that rather than complete radio silence and everybody's imaginations are going wild right so i think that that makes a difference that consistency piece Thank you both. Uh, we received another great question in the chat. Is there any research showing in that departments where officers receive resources to combat stress, there are improvements in police community relations and vice versa? So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lawrence um, to answer this question. <clears throat> Thanks, Jessica. So I'm unaware of any specific studies that have looked at um, officer wellness and uh, availability of resources for their for their well-being. Um, and how that affects their interactions with community members. That being said, there's a lot of like hypotheses that we could certainly uh, expand upon. So there's a lot of research looking at the aspects of procedural justice, which you might be familiar with, but essentially the, um, you know, being respectful, being polite to community members and, and the, you know, very large impact that that can have on police community interactions. Um, that research has shifted a bit toward what's being referred to as internal procedural justice. So how supervisors interact with their staff and how they treat their officers, um, expecting them to behave that way in the field. Um, so what it really does come down to is that if you're going to improve the wellness of your officers, if you're going to have better interactions with them and, and make them you know, less stressed, less burnt out, um, less uh, just overwhelmed with, with the work and, and with life, um, you're going to have the potential to increase their 
their behaviors with community members. They're going to be, you know, in better moods when they're having these types of interactions and more likely to therefore, you know, allow um, time to listen to the community members or, or be respectful and be professional. So I think that there's a lot of, um, there's areas that, you know, need to be studied here, but at the same time, there's certainly uh, correlations that we could easily apply to wellness and how officers interact with community members. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, I'll just also add something to that. There's a concept of um, mental health literacy, right? So where folks actually can understand the, the types of mental health experiences that they're having. And when we look at, you know, connecting mental health and law enforcement and mental health in the community, if our own law enforcement agency members are unable to recognize signs of mental illness in themselves, how are we going to expect them to do that in the community? And so I think that there really is a connection between um, the importance of agency member wellness before they can um, serve uh, appropriately, right, towards uh, members of the community who are also experiencing um, mental distress. Um, so there is another question in the chat. Um, is there a central link or area that we can obtain surveys to provide to our officers? Um, I'll turn to you, Dr. Cunningham. Rithika, there for our survey, it is not made public right now. Um, if you do want to reach out to us, we can um, talk to you about administering the survey to your agency um, as part of the Valor program. Um, you can email Jessica if you want. I know her email was on the um, invitation. Um, and then when we send out the um, link for the video, you, you'll have my contact information as well as Jessica's. So we can definitely work with you on that um, if you'd like to between now and like uh, to the end of September, um, we can definitely help you. Um, and we're excited and want to help other people and give our survey. So please do reach out to us. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. Um, there is another question um, in the in the Q and A. Um, how do you balance trying to reduce stress and improve morale without losing control and still accomplishing the mission? Some employees have unrealistic expectations of what management can and should do. Um, completely understandable. Great question. Um, I'll I'll pass it off to our esteemed panelists to to take a first stab at that. So I have some. Uh, I will share what I used to do, and it's, it's kind of crazy, and it's probably only going to work for smaller agencies. Um, but I think I think some of it, if you tweaked possibly the examples, anyone could follow it. So one of the big things that I, I learned from example, and then that I, I, I tried to do as often as I could, is it didn't matter what job it was, police or fire, it, nothing was below me, even as director. So if it wasn't an extreme critical incident that I absolutely had to be command and I had to make the phone calls to the city manager, politicians, things like that, I would make sure that when I showed up, um, I, I was utilized. So if that was going into a burning house, I would do it. If it was filling air bottles, I would do it. If it was kicking a door, um, I would do it. If I showed up and it was something that was going on um, and it, there was somebody that had been directing traffic for way too long, uh, I would take over. And when I say I, I should say my entire leadership team. So it wasn't just myself. When we had special details and things that would come up, we would try to alternate our schedules sometimes and come in in evenings or nights and help out with the special details. When the workload got too much because we were short staffed, things like that, we'd alternate um, and come in and try to offset. And I'm not saying that's a fix all, but what I'm saying is it does help with the morale and it does help with some of those stressors when they feel like there's either not enough people, they're overworked, management doesn't understand necessarily what they're going through and things like that. And I can tell you that it was a major boost in morale and it also helped out. Now, I will say when we first started doing some of those things, I'm sure there was a lot of uh, what the hell is the director and deputy chiefs doing here and what, you know, is something wrong. But once they started to understand that, it just be kind of, it kind of became commonplace. And then when we did have a serious situation that required us to kind of step back and do, I'll, I'll just say our administrative roles, everybody kind of understood. But if that time passed, then it was back to what can we help out with and that sort of thing. Obviously, there's the bigger picture of what jobs do we have to get done and things like that, but trying to balance those out. And it also goes a long way with the, the, your personnel and, and morale. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, did other other panelists have any um, additional insights? Yeah, I could piggyback a little bit there. You know, it, it it's a great question about 
you know, reducing stress uh, and improving morale and, and not losing control. One of the things that, that we try to do is, you know, that acknowledging reducing stress is part of the mission. It's not done at the expense of the mission. Um, and, you know, what I was talking about earlier with respect to, you know, managing stress as, as a reality, a resource, a commodity, if you will, as part of an operation, as opposed to something that, you know, forces us to throw our hands up and give up or, or, or lose control. So I think the more we just say it's part of the mission and we're going to address it not at the expense of the mission has been a good leadership strategy. Um, and to a point that uh, that was mentioned earlier about making things permanent, um, you know, it, building it into your agency culture that, you know, wellness is not weakness, you know, wellness is fitness. And, you know, if you've got a fitness, you know, culture at your agency, um, you know, build your wellness program on, on top of that, you know, that your officers and your employees should, you know, see wellness as part of preventative maintenance, as part of maybe a yearly physical fitness routine. You know, one thing that we try to say is, you know, uh, we want you to take advantage of all the benefits we give you, whether it's your yearly dental cleanings, your number of prescription glasses, the number of mental health, you know, counseling sessions you can get, you know, it's, it's part of fitness, it's part of the mission, we don't let it defeat us, and we can actually build morale around it that, you know, we acknowledge it, we manage it together, and we don't, you know, let it have a detrimental effect on the mission. But great question. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. Um, we have another question in the chat about um, stress for command staff. So how is the stress command staff is facing today different than it was five or 10 years ago? Um, I will open it up. I, I saw a couple chuckles. I'll open it up to um, any of the team. I just have a little thought. I mean, I'm biased because I'm a mental health professional, right? But I've known in in specializing with um, public safety for you know seven years, and then a social worker for 22 years. What I've seen shift in in a lot of that time is that now the culture is trying to understand wellness and mental health, and that's before it was a little bit different. It was just, you know, pull up your boots and get going, rub some salt in it, right? Like that was this understanding. And now you have legislation that is demanding wellness programs and you have, you know, departments hiring clinicians, but it's leadership that they had no idea what, what does a clinician even do? Like, what is therapy? I mean, very basic concepts of like, how do I even, I don't even know a therapist, right? So, you know, that's a lot of really basic education, like from my side of the things, because they already have all their other organizational stress. And now we're going to put this whole new thing on them about mental health, wellness. I mean, suicide increases, right? Um, addiction issues. How do we pay for that? Right? Like, what do we do with that? Policies, ginormous agencies that don't have policies about transporting uh, uh, somebody or taking a weapon away. I mean, just so I see all of this, you know, as this newer stress and, and maybe others feel differently, but that on my side, that's what I'm seeing. Dr. White, I heard her say right there, one of my points was just the old, kind of that old school mentality of it, it was just, it is what it is, you know, um, I don't want to say get over it necessarily, but it's, just, it's part of the job, right? And now there's a lot more openness that, you know, people will come to you and they're struggling or they have issues. And so it adds stress to you because, you know, you, you have that compassion, you feel for them also, right? So there's that added stress. And then the other thing that I was just going to mention um, for those differences between, you know, then and now, and I know everybody talks about it, but back then I don't remember having to stress that bad about when we started getting shortages um, for personnel. I mean, yes, we had that whole time thing from applications to interviews to hiring to field trained and on the road but you had a huge pool well now I think everybody in the organization um you know depending on your size and how many you're already short and all of that start panicking when people are leaving because now you're thinking oh my gosh it's mandatory overtime what are we going to do about this so it's like that added weight now on the supervisor too because they're thinking oh my gosh I'm already short a couple on my platoon or my shift and now this person's either leaving, retiring, or whatever it's going to be. How long is it going to be before we can get anybody? So I think that that's probably new in the last five, five, ten years also. So thank you so much. And I, I think we have time for one more question uh, before we head to closing. 
And there's a great question in the chat about what would peer support at the supervisor, supervisory level look like or address? Um, and, and does peer support look differently um, for command staff than it does for a line level um, or, or non-sworn? I'll take just peer support's like my passion. So I love it. I'm going to jump in if that's OK. Um, we often forget in the peer support world about command staff. Um, when, when I teach, I say, don't forget them because I've seen many a chief with their head in their hands, right? And they need support too, but there is a unique need there when you start hitting, you know, Lieutenant, you know, all, you know, Captain, all the, the higher ups because people A, don't want to maybe talk to them, but then they also don't want to talk to the other people, right? So it's, it's a matter of, this is one of those proactive things. How are you connecting to other agencies? How are your peer support team connecting to the neighboring department? You know, how is we have in, in Utah, one of the states I, I work with a lot, they have a county, so multi-city um, chief meetings. And, and so they become the support for each other. So is there like a special peer, you know, support in there? And so, when you hit sergeant and, and, you know, frontline, again, every agency has different ranks in there, but you know what I mean, right? Like it's, it's, how are you providing for the different ranks? Do you have a diversity? And, and don't get so caught up on the rank as, as well, respect it, but don't get so caught up on it. Because here's the thing is I know a lot of guys that went to academy with, with the chief, right? They've known each other for 30 years. So he has no problem going and talking to him, right? So we, we sometimes make an assumption because the rank is different that they're not going to go talk to him. But I think if we remember, again, people, connection, right? Allow for variation in rank, connect to other agencies. Um, you will be able to provide what needs to be there. And you're just, you're limited to, to where you're, you're, you set your own limits there, is what I'm saying, so. Thank you. Before we close, did any of our other panelists want to add in on that last question? I'll add, um, Jessica, just briefly um, going back to what Dr. White said is, um, um, I think for us, you know, in terms of peer support, it's, it's true that um, you kind of have to create, again, going back to that safe space and uh, your own network, you know, and, and at least I know for me, as I've been able to move up the ranks, um, just creating that outside network, right? Um, finding counterparts in other agencies, you know, that uh, are dealing with the similar issues um, and just having that trust that I can call that person and um, have her, him or her as part of my network. Um, something that we're doing very recently here in our city, which I think is, uh, is pretty, um, pretty interesting, right? So we're started to partner our new, newly promoted supervisors uh, with a mentor, right, uh, outside of the agency, um, it's a um, higher, higher rank, right, completely different um, part of the city and just started, it's a, it's a formal mentorship, you know, we work with our HR department, very structured, with guidelines, right, with uh, having a clear mission objective as to what that mentoring program is going to look like. And in my opinion, it, it also encompasses uh, uh, peer support, right? Because even though the, the ranks are different, at least um, our newly promoted supervisors um, have that opportunity to to mentor with uh, with uh, in terms of leadership, uh, with um, someone who has um, been through the trenches uh, per se, and that can provide that um, additional peer support. Thank you so much, DC Martinez. I, I saw a lot of folks nodding, and I think that that mentorship is. Is really valuable, and I and I've heard from a lot of folks um, through interviews and just conversations with other agency members that um, it's something that is very desired by them. So um, I applaud you all for starting that initiative. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. I have really enjoyed it, and I can tell that our audience members have too. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Cunningham to close up today. Thanks, Jessica, and I will second what Jessica said. This has been an amazing conversation. Um, thank you to all of our panelists and for all of our participants today, all of the amazing questions. Um, please do be on the lookout for an email from us um, with our recording. Um, if you would like to reach out to us or learn more about our work um, or the surveys, as we mentioned, or, or the study or what we're doing, please do um, either email Jessica or you can email myself. Um, but thank you all 
We hope you have um, a great rest of your day. Thank you.